Judges chapter 20, let's pray and then we'll jump into our Bible study tonight. Lord, thank you for this time in your word. Bless it now as we study together that we might learn, we might grow. Lord, we might be closer to you. And so we just commit this to you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right, so we're looking at the, the last chapter and a half. We ended at chapter 20, right at verse 18. So we've got uh, a chapter and a half to go. And um, um, we will make our way through this tonight. So we'll be closing out the book of Judges this evening. And if you've been with us the, the past few weeks, you will remember me saying that Bible scholars believe the chapter 17 through 21 were added as an epilogue to Judges to highlight the spiritual confusion and sinful condition in Israel at the time. Because these last several chapters are, are really hard to read. There's a lot of grotesque stuff, sinful stuff. There's, there's civil war, there's all this strife. And so it's kind of added just to kind of highlight these are some of the things that happened during the course of the 400 years that are covered by the book of Judges. Judges named Shoftim in Hebrew uh, because these were leaders that God raised up. These are not judges like we think of in a courtroom. These are military leaders that God raised up to lead Israel at this particular time in their history. And so these final chapters just kind of detail this sinful stuff and the spiritual confusion that was prevalent in the day. Where we left off, uh, so that you can have context here in chapter 20, verse 18, we left off with civil war was breaking out in Israel between the 12 tribes of Israel. You have 11 tribes against one tribe. The one tribe that the 11 were fighting against was the tribe of Benjamin. And this happened, this civil war happened, because men from the tribe of Benjamin, who lived in a town called Gibeah, tried to have homosexual relations with a man who was visiting the town of Gibeah. That man who was visiting the town of Gibeah refused their advances, and instead, sadly, he offered his concubine. He offered his concubine for them to have. They took her instead of him. The Bible says that they abused her all through the night. And as a result of sustaining such horrible physical, emotional abuse at their hands, she basically crawls back at dawn the next morning to the home where her husband was staying at this other person's house as they were visiting there in Gibeah. She, the Bible says that she was clutching the threshold of the door and that she dies. The next morning when her husband comes out, he steps over her lifeless body, not realizing at first that she's dead. And he basically says, get up, come on, now we're going to go home. There's no response. He takes her lifeless body, throws it over his donkey, and away they go back home. And then this is where it just gets gruesome and frankly psychotic. This guy takes his concubine, her deceased corpse, cuts her up into 12 pieces, sends one piece to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The message he's trying to communicate is, this is horrible what the men of Gibeah did to my wife. It's, it's too little too late. I mean, his outcry should have been long before this. It should have been no to the men of Gibeah. He's got, he's, he should have protected her. He should have, if necessary, fought them, but not just turned her over to them. So even though this is an appalling thing that the men of Gibeah did to her, he's really responsible because he turned her over to them. But now he wants the whole nation to be outraged about what happened to her. And they are. When they each, each of the 12 tribes, the leaders, when they get a part of her corpse, they are outraged. And so these 11 tribes of Israel come together to make war against their brothers, the tribe of Benjamin. They first try some diplomatic means. They basically say to the tribe of Benjamin, if you turn over the men who did this, we'll deal with them and you can avoid war. But instead, the tribe of Benjamin, instead of being more loyal to God, realizing, yes, in fact, what some of our fellow brothers did was wrong, it was sinful, it was terrible, it dishonored God, we're going to turn them over to you for their, for their justice. Instead of doing that, they were more loyal to their fellow Benjamites than they were to God. And it's going to cost them severely. So war is about to happen here. This is where we left off. 
The Bible says that there are 26,000 men who can bear the sword among the tribe of Benjamin. 26,000 soldiers. But among the rest of the 11 tribes of Israel, there are 400,000. And here they've come ready to gather together. Now, one of the things that, that Israel does representing the 11 tribes is they seek the Lord. They inquire of God, should we really do this? Should we go forward and slaughter here our fellow Benjamites? And this is where we left off, right here in Judges chapter 20, verse 18. Then the children of Israel arose and went up to the house, to the house of God to inquire of God. Now, the house of God at this time is not Jerusalem, it's Shiloh. So they go into the house of God, they inquire of God, they said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Israel? And the Lord said, Judah first. Okay, now, how are they hearing the voice of the Lord? How are they getting direction like this? Back in Old Testament times, there was a process by which they could try to discern the will of God. And it was this process. The high priest carried within his vestment two stones. One was called the Urim, and one was called the Thummim. And it is believed that one stone was white and one stone was black. And one stone meant yes and one stone meant no. So they would inquire of the Lord. This is before the Holy Spirit is given upon, you know, all believers now where we can discern the will of God, read the Bible and have the Holy Spirit to bear witness. This was back in the day when the Holy Spirit was only given on assignment, not poured out upon all people. And so they were seeking the Lord this way. And they would go to the high priest. They would say, okay, should we go against the battle against the Benjamites? What tribe should go first? And then they would probably, what happens is they would systematically go through the 11 tribes. Yes or no? Yes or no? And the priest would reach into his vestment, pull out a stone. If it was the yes stone, that was the tribe that should go first. No is no. So apparently they come to the tribe of Judah. And the stone indicates that's the Lord's will. Judah first. So the tribe of Judah is to go out into military battle first. And here comes day one, verse 19. So the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight against them at Gibeah. And then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah. And on that day cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. Now note this. The small little tribe of Benjamin with only 26,000 soldiers against 400,000, this tribe of Benjamin cuts down 22,000 of the Israelites. And verse 22 says, and the people, that is the men of Israel, encourage themselves. You know, they, they, they're like, we just, we just took a beating here, and this shouldn't be. They, and so they encourage themselves. By the way, can I just add, there, there are times in your journey with the Lord that there will not necessarily be other people who will encourage you. You have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. And you have to just kind of, you know, sit before the Lord and let him minister to you. And so they encouraged themselves and again formed the battle line at the place where they had put themselves in array on the first day. Verse 23, then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening. You know, they're crying out to God, like, why is this happening? And they asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I again draw near to battle for battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against him. So the Lord is saying, This is going to be a way that I display my justice for the terrible thing that they did. So go ahead. Gives them the okay. So now day two of battle. Verse 24. So the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day, and Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah on the second day and cut down to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword. Now note this again. Day one, 21,000 Israelites die in battle. Day two, another 18,000 Israelites die in battle. So now that's 39,000 in the first two days of battle. Out of 400,000, that's almost 10%. It's almost 10% of their army is dead after day two. And this has got to be confusing for them because they're seeking the Lord. They're asking, you know, God, should we do this? And which tribe should go first? And God is saying yes. And God is saying Judah. Well, verse 26, then all the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before God, before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And so the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. 
And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, okay, so this is the high priest, stood before it in those days. They stood before the, the ark saying, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Now, before I read the battle on day three, God has said, I'm going to give you victory on day three, but I want you to notice what happens on day one and two. And for those of you taking notes, we're, we're trying to draw out some lessons from these closing chapters. And so here's lesson number one. Sometimes there are defeats along the way, even when you are in the will of God. Somebody said, you got that one? Yeah, because that is critical to understand. Were they in the will of God or not? Yes, they were. They kept inquiring of the Lord. The Lord said, yes, go up. They said, which tribe? He said, Judah. They even inquire again, should we still do this? And they're going to go into battle day three. But they took a beating day one and two. And so it doesn't really make rational sense that if God said, go ahead and fight as a form of God's justice against the Benjamites, that they should suffer such loss. 21,000 the first day, 18,000 the second day. Like, what's going on? There's no mention of any casualties among the Benjamites. It would be easy in this moment to think, did we get God wrong? I mean, we've been asking him, and he's been saying, yes, he's been confirming it, and yet we're suffering the casualties here, so something doesn't seem to be right. I think it's a good point for us to remember. Sometimes you can be in the center of God's will and still sometimes suffer defeat along the way. There can be things that happen in our lives that don't necessarily make sense. They, they seem to be inconsistent with what God told us. Listen, if you're sure that God told you to do something, hang in there. Sometimes in the course of life, there are periods of like highs and periods of lows, periods of, you know, victories and periods of defeat. There's going to be a time in your Christian walk where you feel like this is a good day and other days, this is a really terrible day. And don't think to yourselves, you know, that you're necessarily out of the will of God, because even in the will of God, there are tragic and difficult things that happen. Well, now let's look at day three, verse 29. Then Israel set men in ambush all around Gibeah, and the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in battle array against Gibeah as at the other times. And so the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. They began to strike down and kill some of the people as at the other times in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. And in the field, about 30 men of Israel. And it says, the children of Benjamin said, they are defeated before us as at first. Well, they, they don't know here what's going to happen. But the children of Israel said, let us flee and draw them away from the city to the highways. So all the men of Israel rose from their place and put themselves in battle array at Baal Tamar. And then Israel's men in ambush burst forth from their position in the plain of Geba, and 10,000 select men from all Israel came against Gibeah, and the battle was fierce. But the Benjamites did not know that disaster was upon them. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites. All these drew the sword. Okay, now, if you remember at the top of the Bible study, there were 400,000 Israelis from the 11 tribes. How many were there from the tribe of Benjamin? 26,000. How many got slaughtered here? 25,100. There's only 900 soldiers left. This battle is fierce. This is a swift defeat. Now, between verse 36 down to verse 46, it's basically kind of a play-by-play -play of the battle. So I'm just going to read through it without commentary. So verse 36. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. The men of Israel had given ground to the Benjamites because they relied on the men in ambush whom they had set against Gibeah. And the men in ambush quickly rushed upon Gibeah. The men in ambush spread out and struck the whole city with the edge of the sword. Now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men in ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise up from the city, whereupon the men of Israel would turn in battle. Now Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 of the men of Israel. 
For they said, Surely they are defeated before us as in the first battle. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and there was the whole city going up in smoke to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned back, the men of Benjamin panicked, for they saw that disaster had come upon them. And therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, and whoever came out of the cities they destroyed in their midst. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily trampled them down as far as the front of Gibeah toward the east. And 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. That's, that's the first 18,000 out of the 25,100. All these were men of valor. Then they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon, and they cut down 5,000 of them on the highways. Then they pursued them relentlessly up to, Gid to, up to Gidom and killed 2,000 of them. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of valor. So here's point number two. This is important for us. Surrender early. The more we continue to sin against God, the more we suffer for it. Here's the reason I say this. The tribe of Benjamin had been given multiple opportunities to just stop and realize that what happened in Gibeah was sinful before God. They could have, you know, administered justice to the few who were a part of that terrible scene in Gibeah, and thousands would have been spared. You know, at first, when the Israelites tried diplomatic negotiations with their fellow brothers, the Benjamites, the Benjamites could have just owned up right then, turned over the guys who were guilty, and, and look how many end up dying in battle among the Benjamites, 25,100. All those people's lives could have been spared. But they didn't surrender. They decided they're going to push forward with something that was terrible. They were defending people who shouldn't have been defended. And in the end, it cost them severely. The idea here is that when we ourselves get, get into a situation where we're sinning before God and we're disobeying Him, the key is surrender early. Because if we will just come clean with God and realize, yeah, this is sin in my life and I want to confess this, I want to get right with you, we spare ourselves tremendous amount of hardship. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Do we understand, how many times will it take us to understand that we bring hardship and difficulty upon ourselves when we continue in unrepentant sin? God is a gracious God. He is a wonderful, loving Father. He is ready to forgive us if we would just come clean and get right with Him. We could spare ourselves so much heartache. The Benjamites here incur their own calamity because they're too stubborn to repent before God. And so that's the message. That's the takeaway. Now, take a look. Verse 47. But 600 men turned and fled. Now, this is about all. You know, out of the 900, now we're down to 600 soldiers among the Benjamites. The 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Ramon, and they stayed at the rock of Ramon for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword from every city, men and beasts, all who were found. They also set fire to all the cities they came to. Now, God didn't tell them to do this. What we see happening here is this is literally overkill. They are, they are going above and beyond. And now they are going to have regrets. Chapter 21. Take a look. Now the men of Israel had sworn on an oath at Mizpah, saying, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. All right, circle the, the city there, Mizpah. Mizpah is an important city in the Bible in the Old Testament. Um, Mizpah will be the place later we will read in 1 Samuel chapter 7 where uh, Samuel gathers the nation of Israel together for a time of repentance. And it is also the place, Mizpah in 1 Samuel chapter 10, where they end up choosing the first king of Israel. Not because that was God's will, but God was determined to give them what they wanted so they could understand how um, it would have been better if they had just stayed with God as king. And so Saul will be chosen as the first king there in Mizpah. So it's an important city. And it is there that uh, kind of, it's a national rallying point. The nation of Israel, the 11 tribes have gotten together and they make this vow here in verse 1. None of us shall give his daughters to Benjamin as a wife. So 
you know, th there were still a few hundred of the uh, Benjamite uh, soldiers who were still alive. There were still other men who were not necessarily a fighting age that were, you know, younger and, and still living among the tribe of Benjamin. So they had not been completely annihilated. But the 11 tribes decide, in addition to, you know, slaughtering most of them, we're not going to give any of our daughters as wives. Like, they're not going to be able to repopulate. Like, just, just let them become extinct. That's the idea that they have here. And then verse 2, then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. And they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? Okay, now let me read this again and just, you know, do you realize what they're asking here? They're like, God, God, why? Why has this come up upon us here in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing? Wait, why do you have to ask God this? You slaughtered them. You know what I'm saying? They, they, don't, they don't need to even inquire of the Lord. The reason why one tribe is missing is because they practically slaughtered the entire tribe. So what's happening here is they now are having kind of buyer's remorse, if you will. They're having regrets. They're like, you know what? We're going to slaughter them. We're going to do even more than what God told us. We're going to start wiping them out every city we can find them in. Oh, and by the way, we're not even going to give our daughters to the, to the surviving men as wives. Just let the whole tribe be exterminated. And then they go to the house of the Lord and they're like, Lord, what have we done? You know, what have we done? We basically wiped out an entire tribe of our people here, almost. And so verse 4, and so it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, he shall surely be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother, and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives for those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? Okay, so now they're trying to identify, what can we do? And so they start to wonder, well, who didn't show up here at Mizpah? Verse 8, and they said... What one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah to the Lord? And in fact, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. Now look what happens. So the congregation sent out there 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them saying, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who has known a man intimately. And so they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. All right, your attention for a moment. What is happening? What's happening? is they realize this is a regrettable thing. We almost slaughtered an entire tribe of the Benjamites and they're not going to get repopulated because we made an oath that we are not going to give our uh, daughters as wives to them. So now pause, then they ask, and by the way, who didn't show up here to this little group meeting at Mizpah? And they're like, you know what? All the people of Jabesh Gilead. Okay, you know what? Let's go slaughter them. What? Wait, 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 didn't you just learn that you shouldn't have slaughtered all the Benjamites as much as you did? That was like you know, overkill. Now you want to go find more people to kill. Like, like what is happening here? Okay, so here's point number three. Here's point number three. Don't compound a foolish decision by making another foolish decision. Repent of the first one and seek the Lord. That's what they should have done. But again, this is an epilogue added for our benefit. That this is just spiritual insanity, and this is like moral calamity here. This is what is happening in Israel at this time. This is not even rational. They get to the place where they are gripped with remorse that they've almost exterminated a whole tribe, and now they just want to go slaughter the men of Jabesh Gilead who didn't show up for the, for the big family meeting. And so off they go. And after they slaughtered 
the people of Jabesh Gilead, who's left but 400 virgins, 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Now, here's, here's what the 11 tribes, the, the Israelites, are going to basically decide. Okay, so we've, we've wiped out everybody at Jabesh Gilead, but we have 400 virgins from Jabesh Gilead. So here's what we'll do. We'll give them, we'll give them as wives to the few Benjamite men who are still alive, and then they can repopulate the tribe. And that's what they do. This is the rest of, of the chapter. Verse 13. And then the whole congregation sent word. This is kind of a kind of a bizarre way that they go about this, but look. Then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the rock of Ramon and announced peace to them. And so Benjamin came back at that time. They're like, okay, we're, we're not going to kill you anymore. Come on, come out, come out of the hiding. And they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead. And yet they had not found enough for them. Okay, so if, if in fact the 600 soldiers who survived are the same 600, you only have 400 virgins, so there, there's not enough, but okay, so, but something's happening. Verse 15, and the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. Well, <laughs> It was the Lord, I mean, you know, the, the Lord said, all right, you know, show them justice, but, but they went above and beyond and they showed them vengeance. And vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And when they took matters into their own hands, they ended up doing something that was more than what they should pin on the Lord. Well, verse 16, then the elders of the congregation said, what shall we do for wives, for those who re remain since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives from our daughters for the children of Israel have sworn an oath saying, cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. And then they said, in fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of, of Labona. And therefore, they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, go, this is where it just gets funny, this is just go, lie in wait in the vineyards, and watch and just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then come out from the vineyards and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh and then go to the land of Benjamin. What? What is, what is happening here? Okay, it just, it just goes from crazy to bizarre. So, so it's like the Israelites have like, okay, you know what? We're not going to give the Benjamites our daughters. Okay, but instead let's go slaughter the bunch of people in Jabesh Gilead. Okay, let's slaughter them. And then they slaughter the people in Jabesh Gilead. Who's left? We got 400 virgins. All Right, let's use them, let's send them to the men of Benjamin because we're not giving our daughters. We'll give these 400 virgins from Jabesh Gilead and we'll let the men of Benjamin marry them and repopulate the tribe. However, however, we don't, we don't, we don't want to just give them to them. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say to these 400 virgins, you guys just dance, just frolic around, like just start dancing around. And all the Benjamite guys are going to say, you hide in the bushes, hide in the vineyards, hide in the vineyards. And so all these Benjamite guys are like crouching in the vineyards. And, like, and when you see the ladies just like dancing and frolicking, you go after him and get a wife. That's what's happening here. This is like so strange. It's like, you know, it was, it was before they had, you know, Tinder. So it's just like, let's, <laughs> let's just uh, hide uh, among the Tinder vineyards and then we'll scare you and then you'll be our wife. And that's what they did. So it's crazy stuff here, but this is what they did. Verse 22. And then it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come to us to complain that we will say to them, be kind to them for our sakes, because we did not take a wife for any of them in the war. For it is not as though you have given the, woman to the, the women to them at this time, making yourselves guilty of your oath. And the children of Benjamin did so. And they took enough wives for their number from those who danced, whom they caught. Gotcha. <laughs> Want to be my wife? I don't have any choice now. And then they went and returned to their inheritance, and they rebuilt the cities and dwelt in them. And so the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. They went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And then here's this closing verse that is the commentary on the whole book of Judges. Look at it. Let's read it out loud. The last verse here, 
uh, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Closing point, lesson for us, please do what is right in God's eyes. This, this book is kind of a low point in Israel's history. There was this cycle of sin. When they were right with God, they had peace. But then they often gave in to idolatry of the nations around them. So God brought the nations around them to spank them. They were under great um, oppression by these other nations until they turned to the Lord. God raised up a judge, then they got right with God again, and they had peace for a time, and then they kept doing this cycle for 400 years. And why? Because in those days, Israel had no king. Well, they had a king. It was King God. But they didn't want to acknowledge God as king. So what were they doing? Whatever was right in their own eyes. You know, in all of the bizarre stuff in the closing chapters of Judges, one important takeaway, when we think about what described the culture of that day, and we think about our own culture, not too far removed. There's a lot of people who want to do what is right in their own eyes. Truth is a very relative thing in our culture today. If there's a phrase that bugs me, but it's indicative of where people are, it's when people go around saying, well, my truth is this. My truth? I mean, truth is absolute. It either is or it isn't. You can't just suddenly decide that you will make up what you think is true. It either is true or it isn't. But that's what happens, you see, when people don't have God as the standard. When they make themselves as the standard, then everybody goes around saying, I'll do what is right in my own eyes. It's my truth. It's my truth. And then I'll fight you over your truth. But when a people honor God and see God is the one who sets the standard, God is the one who defines what is right and what is wrong, God is the one who says what is good and what is evil, and we live according to his standard, well, then we're trying to lead our lives in a way that honors him because he is our king. We don't want to do what is right in our eyes. We want to do what is right in God's eyes. We want to please God. So it's, it's not too far removed when we read Judges from some of the things in our own culture. And again, it's because people don't see God as the standard. Uh, they see themselves. They see culture. They see the majority, whatever the voices say, the most voices say, then that must be what is true. No? No, it's what God says. For that reason, when you determine to live according to God's standard, some in the culture will think you're haters, you're bigots, you're intolerant, you're this, you're that. When in reality, you're just trying to honor God and live according to what God defines as right and wrong. What is true and false? What is up? What is down? Isaiah prophesied and he said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. We're living in a time where it's upside down truth. People want to determine what they think is right and wrong based on their own personal idea of truth. You stand strong, Christian. And you don't need to do it in an abrasive, unkind way. But don't compromise. Make sure that you live your life because you want to do what is right in God's eyes. Let the naysayers say what they want. Because as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Father, for your truth. And we pray that we would be people who would do what is right in your eyes, not what is right in our own eyes. May we submit ourselves to you, to your word, to your standard. You are perfect in all your ways, Lord. And we just want to live our lives in a way that pleases you and honors you. So help us. Help us, Lord, not to get caught in the trap of our culture, but to follow after you with all our heart, to please you, Lord, to honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen.